Okay, magic, religion, science, what's next? Uh, this actually fits pretty well after Deepak's talk, because what's next I'm proposing is magic 2.0, uh, which we can think of, in other words, as reality hacking. Let me unpack that. First of all, what do I mean by magic? I don't mean fake magic. Fake magic is a lot of fun, but that's not what I mean. Uh, I also don't mean fictional magic. I'm talking about real magic. Just as a matter of curiosity, how many of you out there are working practical magicians? A couple. Oh, good. So by real magic, it, it falls into three categories. First of all, we have divination. And this, by the way, is if you do a synthesis across millennia, it falls into three categories. So we have divination, we have expression of will, will changing the fabric of reality, and we have theurgy, or otherwise known as necromancy, which is evoking spirits and getting them to do things on your behalf. So those are the, the three categories of magic, real magic. When, if, if you talk to somebody in the academic world, including religious scholars and anthropologists and so on, what they paint is a picture that looks kind of like this, that in very ancient times we had savages or primitives who believed in uh, animism and that was magic. And then this became codified into religion and then this became science. This is the evolutionary path and people uh, like anthropologists like uh, James Frazier were made this a popular way of thinking about the evolution of the history of ideas. But in fact, if you use the, uh, the wall in uh, Game of Thrones as the way of separating things, uh, today magic, real magic, is considered to be a little tiny circle somewhere on one side of the wall. And it's, it overlaps with religion because they both basically are talking about similar things, although magic is practical and religion is more or less theoretical. But science is a big, big thing now in terms of arbiter of truth and it's on the other side of the wall. They don't mix at all. But I'm gonna propose that actually that's not completely correct. That if you look at the number of people who did today in the world who believe in one religion or another, it's big, it's huge. 90%, something like that. So religion has not gone away at all. And by the same token, science is quite healthy and doing quite well, but in terms of the number of scientists who are actively participating in that, in that job, there are many fewer scientists than there are people who believe in religion, and a pretty large overlap of people who are scientists also believe in religion. So I'm proposing then that magic actually is a substrate that both of these are embedded within. It has never gone away. It is not exactly animism. It's a lot closer to what Deepak was talking about. So I'll, I'll describe why. So first of all, do people use magic? And the answer is yes. Magic is used everywhere by practically everyone all the time. So we see it most often in terms of, of not necessarily magical thinking, but in terms of superstition. Superstitions saturate almost everything that we do. So I like uh, the one on the lower right, I believe, is a, a superstition from Korea that you shouldn't take pictures that have three people in it because one of them will die. I didn't know that. And then we have, of course, terrors of the evil eye, and we have statues of Ganesha and so on. These, these are all very, very popular things. If you're wearing a religious object, like a cross or mala beads or something like that, that's a superstition. Here we have a bunch of people who are exercising their will to do something. Now, they could be praying to God as a matter of worship, but oftentimes the prayer is involved in manipulating the world in some way. Well, that's magic. Here we have a different form of magic. Here we have Hindus for Trump. And of course, praying for peace. Well, these are acts of will. They're expression of will to try to change the way that the world is, is working. Uh, we also have very explicitly magical practices within Catholicism and other religions. This is, of course, one of the reasons why the Reformation occurred in the first place. And people said, this isn't religion, this is magic. Well, today you can go to Catholic ceremonies and see magic happening. That's what it's all about. 
Religion definitely believes in magic, but it violently bans it. So we know from the Middle Ages that the uh, Malleus Maleficarum basically gave the right for anybody to kill witches. And probably hundreds of thousands of people, most of whom were completely innocent, were killed as a result of this bull, papal bull. So this is gonna be a theme I'm gonna talk about again and again, which is terror. There's a certain degree of terror that is created by the notion of magic. Now some of this was because of social control, like the, the Catholic Church in particular didn't like the fact that some people might be more attractive than the priests, and so they banned pagan ideas which involved magic. So we even have this thing, like this is a cartoon from now, that says basically that God hates witchcraft, uh, and at the time it was a crime punishable by death. So here we have a young girl who's somehow been possessed by a spirit. So in Jesus' name, come out of her. And then comes out and she says, oh, what happened, Uncle Bob? Everything has changed. Tell me, Samantha, how did you and Holly get into the craft by which he meant witchcraft through the Harry Potter books? <laughs> the Harry Potter books are a very good indication of what I'm talking about here. They're the, the most popular books in the world. have earned billions and billions of dollars for, the, for J.K. Rowling. And yet they're also the number one most banned book in the world, both at the same time. So again, we're looking at terror among some people. Unfortunately, the persecution of witches has not stopped. There are countries today where it is still illegal and people are killed as a result of being declared a witch. Some of them might be practicing witchcraft, but in most cases, it's a convenient way to get rid of a neighbor who is bothering you. So terror consists there. And even today, this mass hysteria over the, the creepy clowns. This shows how fragile our society is. So we somebody gets in their mind that there's something bad about clowns, and there are, by the way, clowns are just not, they're not right. <laughs> so here's again another kind of terror. It's very easy to whip up the population as we see certain people do. So that's religion. Well, science denies magic. Science regards it as primitive and ancient, and we're way beyond that now. So it's okay to think in terms of, of ancient esoteric ideas like alchemy and astrology and herbalism because they turned into science. And what I'm proposing here is that magic 2.0 actually is a kind of a science. We haven't quite caught up to it yet, but eventually it will be there. So what's left out of these three examples is the science of the mind. Once we understand that better, that will become magic 2.0. So you find books like this, the, the science of Harry Potter, with the little green thing saying how it really works. Well, how it really works is basically a deconstruction in terms of existing and maybe science fiction technology to explain things like what Harry Potter did. And in my opinion, completely fails. And then we, of course we have Richard Dawkins who doesn't like anything. <laughs> so, the terror aspect of here, you can see pretty nicely here from uh, skeptic Michael Shermer, who wrote in his column in Scientific American two years ago about an anomalous event that shook his skepticism to the core. So he wrote, often I'm asked if I've ever encountered something I could not explain, something that would suggest the existence of the paranormal or the supernatural. My answer is yes, now I have. This is Michael Shermer in Scientific American. So, that what he's talking about is that uh, he and his fiance uh, were looking at a radio that was the fiance's grandfather's. And she was sad because the grandfather had passed away and they were getting married and so he wouldn't be available at the, the wedding. So he was fiddling with the radio to try to get it to work and it hadn't worked in many years. He put batteries in it, shook it around, stuff completely dead. So some time goes by, they get married, they come back to the house and the radio is playing and it's playing a song which is meaningful to, this, to the new wife who is saying that the grandfather is pleased. So this freaks both of them out. The radio continues to play for the rest of the day and then the radio stops and never played again. So this is the story that, that he's, he's saying. So he says in here, if we're to take seriously the scientific credo to keep an open mind and remain agnostic, we should not shut the doors of perception. We should allow this thing. So two years go by, and now he publishes this. Is it possible 
to measure supernatural or paranormal phenomena. We must resist the temptation because such efforts will never succeed. This shows here's a form of terror, that when some people encounter things that they don't wish to believe, they will eventually erase it. Well, in this case, we know we can't erase it because you can find this article online. There are many examples of scientists who were basically occultists or magicians who have been written out of history. So this is an example of Jack Parsons, who's one of the founders of the Jet Propulsion Lab at uh, Cal State, or, or not Cal State, Caltech. So Parsons believed in magic. He did um, performances, occult performances, which he thought would help him in the development of jet propulsion, which it did. And if you go to the NASA's website or JPL, you can't find him anymore in there because he was a little bit too out about his magical beliefs. And by the same token, if you look through the history of what we consider to be scientific pioneers, all of them were somewhere between mystics and magicians. So, in the academic world, the scholarly tradition, we look at anthropology, history, sociology, psychology, and even psychiatry, and all of it basically looks at magic and says this is primitive, this is a psychiatric problem, uh, and there are a lot of polemics that have been written for centuries now saying that people who believe in that stuff have a problem. So magic is false and dangerous. From the magical tradition, I'm talking about people who practice magic, ceremonial magic, ritual magic, other kinds of magic, they say, well, certainly magic exists. There are vast cultural variations on it. There are essential commonalities across the, the millennia. And it's a very experimental and practical activity. In many ways, it is empirical science because you don't do magical spells if they don't work anymore. So it's an empirical uh, effort. So in that sense, they say magic exists, but it's impossible to scientifically test. You see this many times in, in both old and new books about magic. So in both cases, we have this condition of no scientific evidence to support why anybody would believe in magic. So from the point of view of scientists, theists, academics, and magicians, magic? No, even J.K. Rowling has disavowed any interest in magic or the occult. It's not safe to do so. I'm saying so. So, so much for magic. All gone, except for a small problem. The small problem is that the major claims of magic have been tested by science for about 150 years, and it works. So I've written about this in three books so far. The first book was basically saying, how do we know that it works? What is the evidence like? Uh, there are repeatable effects under control conditions. They're not in the context of magic, but they're looking at those three categories of magic. Then the second book was saying why this, these kinds of phenomena do not violate what we know about physics. And then the third book was looking at a practice, a, an advanced form of meditation, basically yoga, in which these abilities can be trained. So why would anyone believe me? I mean, it's my opinion, basically, when I write a book. So what we turn to when we have a lot of data to analyze are statisticians. So here's Jessica Utz, who's a professor of statistics at UC Irvine. She also happens to be, this year, the president of the American Statistical Association. So Jessica is the, the author of a number of, of uh, very, very well-received books on statistics. So in many ways, she has literally written the book on the way that statistics is taught today. So, a couple of months ago in, uh, in Chicago, there was the, the joint meetings of the statistical associations in, around the world. At the meeting, there were 6,000 statisticians in the audience. So imagine this times roughly, I don't know, 10 perhaps, all statisticians. And this is what she said, among other things. And you can, you can watch her, her uh, talk online. So she says at one point, for many years, I've worked with researchers doing very careful work in this area, meaning psychic phenomena including a year that I spent full-time working on a classified project for the United States government to see if we could use psychic abilities for intelligence gathering during the Cold War. This is actually during that program that I met Jessica about 30 years ago. She goes on to say, at the end of that project, I wrote a report for Congress stating what I still think is true, 
the data in support of precognition and possibly other related phenomena is quite strong statistically and would be widely accepted if it pertained to something more mundane. Yet most scientists reject the possible reality of these abilities without ever looking at data. So what this says is basically the game's over. The game is over in terms of, of trying to convince somebody that the phenomena are real. So if psychic phenomena are real, if what Deepak said is correct, then magic has to exist because that's essentially what it is. It is not like Harry Potter because Harry Potter is an embellishment of underlying ideas. But nevertheless, a phenomenon exists. So the, the book that I'm currently writing now, which is why I'm doing a talk on this topic, is about magic. And it's from the point of view of what, what can science actually say about the practice of magic. And so I've done a, a historical synthesis of basically everything that we know about the practice of magic to show what parts work and what parts don't work. I'll have a section in the book on how to be a magician and a much longer section which says why you don't want to do that. <laughs> so when you, you look at the literature here, most of it is within the esoteric literature. So the Egyptian magic and then there's Chinese magic and Arabic magic and there's Greek magic, and there's Indian magic, and there's Mayan magic, and many other kinds of magic. <laughs> you immediately run into the Kabbalah. A lot of magic is based on the Kabbalah. The Hermetic tradition, this is the Emerald Tablet, like the summary of Hermeticism. Uh, Neoplatonic ideas, the mystery schools of Egypt, of Greece, and in the modern day, the Jedi mystery schools. Uh, the, the Gnosticism, of course, and the more recent discovery of the Gnostic Gospels, which are a modern version of looking back now at what was said about Gnosticism. In the Middle Ages, uh, the Rosicrucians began in 1927. The, uh, the American version of Rosicrucianism started, and it's like within a mile of where we are here. It's a nice museum if you haven't looked at it yet. Then we have the Freemasons. Uh, does anybody know, when you, when you go out in the world, and you, you mainly will see things about Masons, not so much Freemasons, but the original world is Freemasons. Why? Because the, there are two types of stone that were used in the building of Gothic cathedrals. One was the, the foundation, the base, which was a hard stone, and then all of the gargoyles and other things that were put on there were made out of something called Freemason, which is a much softer stone. So they could, ch they could chisel it and carve it out. So that's where the term Freemason comes from. Uh, then we have Mesmer. So Mesmer was important because he was one of the first to take what was the, the, at that time the rising interest in science and trying to apply it to basically what amounts to magic. We have the uh, hermetic uh, tradition of the Golden Dawn in the 1880s. Uh, Blavatsky, uh, roughly about the same time. Then we have people like uh, Mary Baker Eddy in Christian Science. Uh, characters like uh, Aleister Crowley, uh, Gurdjieff and Ospensky. And then uh, starting in about the 1970s, a uh, modern form of magic called chaos magic. And this was basically uh, a way, it's like a mashup of punk rock, science fiction, science, and ceremonial magic. And it was, it was a, a reaction to the way that people thought about magic at the time, which was major ceremonies with hoods and robes and darkness and all the rest. And so this was a way of looking at the practice of magic and saying, let's strip out all of that ancient stuff because it's not necessary in the first place. So that's where chaos magic comes from. You can download this now as a graphic novel, which brings it even up to date more. The, the Psychonaut Field Manual, which is a, a relatively modern, within the last couple of years, way of taking chaos magic and making it even more up to date. It's quite good. And of course, we have all of these books. All of these books come out of the magical tradition. They're all about the use of affirmations to change your life and lives around you. These are all big best-selling books, and it continues to the present day. Uh, one book, I think, which is a nice way of summarizing it is the one by Mitch Horowitz at the end there called One Simple Idea. And it's talking about this idea that what you believe comes true. Sounds ridiculously simple, but in many ways that is at least one aspect of what magic is about. 
We have neo-paganism everywhere now. Burning Man's very popular. So when you synthesize all of this, you have the perennial philosophy of magic, which basically is this, that space, time, and mind emerge or emanate or manifest from the one mind. Consciousness is fundamental. The exercise of will manipulates reality. Divination is that mind can, in principle, know everything. And theurgy, which is a physical embodiment, is only one form of mind. This would give rise to the possibility that there are spirits or disembodied things out there. So another way of looking at it is this very popular metaphor that William James and many others have, have talked about. So basically, we everyday world is the classical domain. Things are separate. Uh, they operate with their observer independence and so on. So this is the conscious awareness. Below that is a much bigger domain. At least the just below the surface is what I would call the quantum domain. So things are interconnected, just like the iceberg is interconnected, it's observer dependent and so on. Many of the things that Deepak had just said. Below that is much more. Below that is some sort of post-quantum domain. It's an abstract informational uh, construct at this point. And this is where samadhi, mystical union, gnosis occurs. And this is the, the realm where magic happens. So we have imagination. A lot of the magical traditions start with the notion that imagination creates reality. So you have imagination that bubbles up from that domain and it manifests here. That's one aspect of magic. But does this really work? And one of the aspects of magic is that you must believe in it. Belief is considered a modulator of whether these things are true. So let me give you an example. Actually, I have no, no idea how much time I have left. Anything? I don't see the, the clock that shows me. Eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. So does this really work? Well, let's look at the tea ceremony as an example. So the tea ceremony is interesting in China because it's all about an intentional practice. It's not simply drinking tea. It's the intention behind it. So we did this following experiment. This is the group of people in Taiwan who actually uh, collaborated with me. And my primary collaborator is there in the middle. It's a uh, young Song Shia, who's a psychologist, and the Buddhist monks. We made a big batch, a batch of oolong tea, separated it into two pieces. One uh, batch of tea was uh, blessed by the Buddhist monks in such a way that anybody who would drink that tea would have their mood elevated. That was the blessing. And the other one, of course, was the control tea. They were put in little bottles. They were distributed uh, randomly in a, a double-blind fashion to 100 people in each group. Uh, and they were then asked to drink the tea on the middle five days of the week and to track their mood every day. So what we found, first of all, is that belief affects mood. If you believe that you were drinking the treated or the blessed tea, people's mood improved. There's a placebo effect. If you didn't, uh, people who said that they, uh, they didn't know if they were drinking treated tea, the one on the far right, their mood is still elevated a little bit. And people who believe that they were not getting the treated tea, their mood did not change. So, the placebo-controlled test here is this, that everyone believes that the tea that they're drinking has been treated, been blessed. But some of them are getting the treated tea, and some of them are not getting the treated tea. So this is the placebo control, and there you can see that the mood of the people getting the actual tea was better than the people getting the control tea. So this is a classic placebo control, because we've controlled for their belief. So it shows that the intentional practice worked. The next thing we look at is the nocebo control. So these are, everyone believes that, uh, that they're not getting the treated tea. So no one believes they're getting the treated tea. Some do get it, and some don't get it, and now there's no difference in mood. The third condition is they're uncertain. Again, there's no difference in these two groups. So this is the important part. The placebo enhancement effect is looking at that, that comparison. So these are, everyone is drinking treated tea, but some believe it, and some don't. The ones who believe it do incredibly better, 800% better in terms of mood elevation than the ones who are drinking exactly the same tea but they don't believe it. So this is one example of many I'm gonna talk about in the book where we're looking at the principles of magic and the, as I said, one of the primary ones is that you must believe in the actual treatment and it, because it modulates the effect. So here's another example. 
well, first we get to a little bit of magic. The magic beans of coffee. So theurgy. Now theurgy is more difficult to test because it, it, we don't know if spirits are actually out there or not. But the caption says, oh, sorry, I think I just butt summoned you. <laughs> but here, too, we can do experiments, and we have done experiments. So here we go. So the image of a medium, unfortunately, is Madame Zodiac. Uh, what we work with are mediums who have been in positions of very high authority, who are also extremely good at what they do. So this is Suzanne Geisman, who was the former commanding officer and aide to the chairman of the G Joint Chiefs of Staff. So this is a person who is very well grounded, a Navy commander who also happens to be in an excellent medium. So what we did in the lab is check one of the ideas that mediums tell us sometimes, which is if they look at a picture, they can sense if the person who is alive or dead. So in this case, some of those people are alive and some of them are dead. So what you do in the lab is in the upper left, you take, start with a picture. Now you want to adjust the pictures of the people who are alive and dead so that you can't guess by the way the picture looks if they're alive or dead. So you take the original picture, you free, reframe it so the faces are all in the same way, you put it into grayscale, and then you match the images according to whether the person is smiling in the picture, or looking at the camera, or looking to the side, and many other things, eight different dimensions. And then so we have end up with 100 pictures of somebody alive and 100 where we know that they're dead. But there's no way to tell the difference between the pictures. We also take their EEG while they're looking at these pictures. We ask them to say, do you think they're alive or think they're dead? So when you look at the behavioral response, which is simply saying, I think they're alive or dead, overall, it's only 53.6% correct, but that's statistically significant, so this is not a chance response. And as you see in the column on the right, some people did much better than others. Some mediums did quite well. When you look at the brain response, the only thing I have time to talk about is this. This is looking at their brain when the image that they're looking at is a deceased person and this is 100 milliseconds after the image appears. This is before they have a conscious response. 100 milliseconds before that, if they are correct in saying the person is dead, their brain is responding differently than if they're incorrect. So somehow they unconsciously know immediately, 100 milliseconds after looking at the image, that they get the difference between correct and incorrect. So we published this in a journal prediction of mortality based on facial characteristics. It was seen many, many thousands of times. This is way more times than a typical paper is viewed. We, our conclusions were, were pretty simple regarding alleged claims of clairvoyance. Our data does not allow for a rigorous test of that hypothesis, but it's certainly compatible with it. That's about as far as we went on this, because this we're talking to a scientific audience. So about a month ago, we get a notice of retraction. The journal is taking the paper out of circulation. So they say, well, the concerns were raised that the, the findings and, asser and assertions were not sufficiently matched by the level of verifiable evidence. Certain aspects of the paper. So of course, we were alarmed, and we immediately went to the person who was going to do the retraction and said, well, what aspects? What are you talking about? This past peer review, it was actually published for four months. The usual reason for retraction is either fraud has been discovered or a mistake has been discovered which the authors agree to and they want to pull the paper out of circulation. Those are the primary reasons. So we asked, do you think it's fraud? They said, no, it's not fraud. Is it a mistake? No, it's not a mistake. Well, what is it? They will not tell us. They gave us, and usually in this kind of case, they go to the authors and say, do you want to respond? to the charges against you, they did not give us that opportunity. So we're dealing with a different kind of terror. In this case, it's terror that somebody brought some, something to the uh, notice of the senior editors and said, I don't want to publish in a journal that looks a little bit too soft on this topic. And for their own reasons, they decided to retract the paper. So we're not, gonna, we're not taking this lightly. We're going to challenge that. I also want to end with this. So this is a book by Julia Mossbridge and Emance Barris, Transcendent Mind. 
Uh, it says, we are in the midst of a sea change. Receding from view is materialism. Approaching our sights is a complete reversal of perspective. According to this alternative view, consciousness is primary and the physical is secondary. So why is this important and a little bit different? I mean, it's, it's what we're going to hear at this conference again and again. It's because it's published by the American Psychological Association. Very conservative, and yet it does show that there's people in positions to publish books of this type now that are beginning to see that a post-materialist view actually makes some sense. That's a major advancement, and that will reduce some of the terror that we've seen in the past. Someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. So I'm going to end right there, and I thank you for your kind attention.